title of my talk, and the titles and the speakers before and after me, I thought, well, the only way to deal with this is to tell you some stories. So we're into story time. Um, I have actually consulted many of my colleagues, so I can bring them, sorry, I can bring you their stories. And what I really am actually hoping is that our stories will resonate with you because you're teaching on the whole uh, the same type of, um, <coughs> I'm not going to say method. <laughs> I've been a, a, a teacher for a long time. I'm, I'm actually rather horrified when I look back at um, the fact that it's, it's becoming a very long time. Um, and I started my teaching career, and I'm just going to put this in very, very quickly, I'm running a, a playbook in central Rome. Um, and I was um, a young mother with two small boys. And their lives, they're ahead of me. And all the children at my little play group, um, their lives, they're ahead of me. And the point I'm trying to make here is that there's always a point at which a child's life lies ahead of him. And I think that as teachers, we know that we're there to develop the potential and the promise that lies within every child. And I think that what has disturbed me so much during 30 years of teaching is to see how we can destroy the potential and the promise that lies in the lives of each of these children. I had great fun with my play group. We actually all had a lot of fun. It was um, in the 1970s, and it was um, play and fun and clay and paint and sand pits and sandpaper letters and listening with mother stories. But actually, when I started to think about it the other day, I also remember the great importance that we gave to the children's activities. All that sorting and ordering putting the red bricks in the shape of a triangle into the right shape, matching the pictures, counting the cherries, two cherries and another two cherries, four cherries. How do children make sense of their world? By sorting and ordering, by matching and comparing, by asking questions and getting answers, by moving logically and in simple steps, from the concrete to the abstract, by being supported by caring adults who have the answers, who have the information, and who know how the child, his mind, works. Activities that are brain-friendly, that help children begin to come to grips with their world. And my point here is that we must extend our brain-friendly, hands-on teaching to reading, the most abstract concept of them all, if we are to succeed in teaching our children to read. Brains do not cope with randomness. Random, muddled thinking is a kind of torture to the brain. And I'm working with children now every single day <coughs> that have been from playgroup to classroom teaching, um, I went to primary school and middle school and horrifyingly spent um, an awfully long time there, so I'm counting up something like 30 years. 